right. So um, good afternoon. Um, today we're going to talk about the release pipeline model for mere mortals. Um, it's kind of a bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek joke. It's really kind of around encouraging more ops guys to take advantage of the technology. Um, you know, most of the talk today is very conceptual. I'm going to show you some demos. They're going to be using, you know, VSTS and Azure predominantly because that's what I do uh, for a living. Um, but I've tried to keep them high level enough that you can take that and apply it to, you know, AppVayer, TeamCity, Jenkins, whatever really works for you. Um, you're not really tied to a platform once you've got the concepts. So, so my name is Ryan Coates. I'm the practice director at PCM for Azure and Cloud Platform. So I own all the delivery engineers and the pre-sales engineers around the Microsoft Azure and uh, server stack. So I have a team of about 10 people, um, which apparently is not enough. <laughs> um, been an infrastructure guy most of my life. I got my first MCC when I was 14. I'm not sure how. Um, actually, I said to Mark Vanessi the other day, you know, it's weird seeing his last session because I'm pretty sure I had his NT4 book when I was younger, and that's what kind of helped me get it, get him on. I'm also a foreigner. I'm from the UK. I've lived here 10 years, and my accent is very odd because it comes and goes. So if uh, something doesn't sound right, just you yell at me, throw something at me, whatever. I know, it's, it's weird because it'll come and go depending on who I'm talking to in a conversation. And, you know, I'll talk to the British guy and it'll sound British and I'll turn to the American and it'll sound sort of British. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good pub trick. <laughs> All right, so the agenda today, we're going to kind of go over the various pieces of the build pipeline. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, what it is, um, what each part of it really is for and what can can you do with it? Um, and then we'll talk about if you want to learn more. Um, I've got some links to some of the other sessions going on this week. Um, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. So. The release pipeline, what? Um, what is it? So the release pipeline model well, is, um, it's really a conceptual model. And it's not, it's not a particularly new one. Um, it's new to a lot of us ops folks. Uh, but to those of you with dev experience, you've probably heard of the term CI, CD, you know, build pipeline, all of this stuff is not, not particularly new. We've probably been around 15 plus years in the dev space um, and in DevOps in general. Um, sometimes you'll think of it as this very complicated automation beast. Um, if you've seen some of the complicated builds that some of the, you know, some of the vendors are putting on to get their tools out, they look scary. Um, but really what, what the build pipeline is, it's a, it's a server that runs code that you tell it to run. It's quite simple, it's a task runner. Um, it's like a scheduled task on steroids. So, you know, if you can use a ster if you can use steroids, <laughs> if you can use a scheduled task, you can probably use a build tool. Um, again, you can build on top of that. You can make them as complicated as you want. You can make them as broad and as scalable as you want, more often than not. But you can get started with a Hello World script, and we're going to go through some of that. Uh, you can automate almost anything on it. You know, your build server is it's just a server. If you want to run some Python code, make sure Python's on the build server. It'll run Python. You want it to run PowerShell, make sure PowerShell's on it. You want to run an Azure RM PowerShell module? Well, make sure the module's on it, right? That's really all it is. You want to build on top of that. You want to build custom code for your internal business apps. Make, as long as the build, if the server can run it, you can automate it. And it's available in lots of flavors, okay? So a lot of you here, I think I've seen you talk. Some of you using TeamCity, some of you using AppVayer. Um, there's a lot of platforms out there. Your mileage may vary. I'm going to show you VSTS from a high level, but I really want you to just take away the concepts and use whatever works for you. Some of these platforms are free, some of them have limitations, some of them have enterprise versions and you know, that kind of thing. So, so really, like I said, um, it's really the, the release pipeline model is the, is the conceptual model behind CI, CD. So those of you familiar with these terms, um, you've probably heard them a lot in the app world, uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, continuous integration is really the act of when I commit code changes, I want something to occur from that, uh, whether that be a, you know, I need to rebuild binaries, I need to generate artifacts from this. And continuous delivery takes it a step further, takes those binaries and does something with them. So if I was updating a website, continuous integration would say, cool, let's package my website, let's have that zip file ready to go, that web deploy package ready to go. Continuous deployment would probably put it somewhere. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be in production. Um, you can still be doing CD without updating your production website every, every day. And I'm not gonna go into the, the realms of feature flags and stuff like that today, but as long as you have a deployable piece of code, you, you're considered continuous deployment, right? If you've got something that's tested and ready to go and that you can throw at something when it matters. Uh, and that's really important for us as ops guys because you know, we're sitting there and we're, we're making changes to infrastructure. And today that's very, I won't say point and clicky because all of you probably hate the mouse, um, but it is very much, 
you know, instantiated on a case by case basis. I have to go and change a router config. I have to go change a, you know, a virtual machine config. I may be doing it in PowerShell. I may be doing it in code, but I'm probably doing it by hand more often than not. And that's a challenge for us because when we, you know, I think they say like what 90, 90 plus percent of issues are human introduced. So, you know, it's me clicking the wrong thing. It's me putting the wrong path in an output. It's me running the wrong script when I should have not done the delete. Right? It's me causing those problems. And as we move into this kind of cadence of change that the cloud offers us, um, those changes are more rapid. Those problems are bigger. They affect larger footprints. You know, you all remember things like you know, when Amazon S3 goes down, the internet stops. And, and to most of your users and consumers, that's the internet's down. No, no, it's just S3. It just, you know, half the internet sits on it. It's not, <laughs> the internet's still there, right? <laughs> you know, I remember uh, back in the day, you guys uh, probably been around long enough, uh, used to go into a data center and there'd be this pull-out tray, you know, big old screen on it, and you know, tap away and connect to your servers. And that's how you made changes. You walked in the room, you did what you needed to do, you, you put the thing away. And eventually it became a fold-up one because you had an LCD, so that was nice. And then we started getting things like ISO 27001 and other such things that said, no, no, don't go in the data center. If you do, you've got to fill in all these forms. <laughs> don't, don't go in there. And now we're at a point where letting people go into data centers or rooms where data is stored is probably one of the biggest risk factors to them. You know, that, that is their data. And when you have physical access to it, that is the highest risk. So part of the build release pipeline kind of concept for ops people is around making the automation engine the engine of change. Right? We, we don't want to be the ones typing commands in, unverified, untested, you know, sure, sometimes, oh, it's got to happen right now, go fix it, go fix it. That's great until that happens again tomorrow and you're on vacation, right? What did you do? Well, I don't know, I didn't document it. I didn't do this, I didn't test it, I just ran it and solved the problem. And we're all guilty of that. We all kind of have bosses that kind of expect that of us, but it's not really the, the way as we move into the kind of DevOps world that things should get done. It's just a bit more visual representation. Um, again, this is a Microsoft image I stole. So um, everything starts with code. Code is critical to, to this concept. If you're still clicking next, 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 um, the build release pipeline is probably not going to work for you unless you can find a way to hammer the keyboard and mouse automatically. <laughs> um, once we've got our items in the source control, then we can start doing things with them. Um, now, I asked earlier, you know, how many of you are using CI, CD, or, or sorry, configuration as code, infrastructure as code today, and not too many hands went up. Um, I assume many of you are interested in it, though. Is that, is that right? Is that fair? Okay. Well, it, it is, it, it is, no, it is mythical in a way, <laughs> you know, they're, um, especially, you know, most orgs don't understand the upfront time investment required to do it, you know. It's like, I can just go and click next, next, next and install something. Well, yeah, but then I, then I can't do it again tomorrow when it blows up. I can spend a little longer. I can write my install scripts. I can write my, my DSC configurations. And now if something goes wrong, I can redeploy that server in minutes or seconds. Really, it just depends on what the infrastructure is, right? So the first, start of the, first part of the pipeline is code. And it's, it's often the, the bit people forget about. They talk about the build release pipeline. They just assume it starts at build. But build can't do anything without code. Now, you know, in the app world, that's fine. All the apps are code. In the infrastructure world, we don't have a lot of code. You guys have just made that clear. <laughs> we don't have much yet. Um, but this is where it starts. We've got to have DSC scripts. We have chef cookbooks, and I'm not sure what they call them in Puppet, and I'm sure I'll get yelled at later for that. Um, you know, these things have to exist. If they don't, what can we build from? Um, any of you use Azure or a AWS? Okay, so ARM templates, uh, Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundation, whatever they're called. Yeah, formation, right? These are all like JSON files, so these are code. You can put them in source control. Uh, even if you go through the GUI in Azure when you're finished, it'll give you this really ugly JSON file. It's kind of like it's kind of like the front page of, of ARM templates. It's like here, we've defined everything line by line for you. I think you were making this joke in your talk, right? <laughs> it's like you got to clean them up a little if you really want, but you don't have to. They work as is. But it's like yeah, we've parameterized everything for you and we've given it the, the value you gave. Not particularly reusable, but good if you want to just deploy that exact instance again. And that's the thing with things like ARM templates. You know, we we you've probably heard the talk about immutable infrastructure and stuff like that. If you delete part of a resource group in Azure and redeploy the ARM template, it'll work out what's missing and it'll go put it back, right? Um, within reason. I think if you delete the VM, it gets a little upset. <laughs> but if you delete the NIC or you, you, know, you delete that public IP, it'll go back and say, oh, there's supposed to be a public IP. I'm going to put that back. So it kind of really helps encourage you kind of that, that kind of problem solving. I've got my code. The state is different than what the code says it should be. So I'm going to go fix it. So start with code. You know? Um, 
PowerShell scripts and modules can be used in the build system. So there's a first part of code. We're all familiar with those. Um, IAC turns up environments. It's used for building systems. Uh, networking device, devices, VMs, it's, it's, it's your infrastructure piece. It's different from configuration as code. Now you'll find some people use the words interchangeably, but configuration as code really needs something to configure, and infrastructure as code does not. Um, had an interesting chat at lunch about Terraform and how, you know, what, what do we use to actually build infrastructure? ARM templates, you know, Terraform, stuff like that. Once it's up, we probably don't use ARM templates or Terraform to configure it. In fact, we would use something like DSC or Ansible or something that, that touches the device after you've created it. Um, so these are generally different types of configurations, but you can get them all in code, so go for it. Um, I, I say inside configuration and outside configuration, but I like that there's actually a term for infrastructure as code as opposed to configuration. Well, there is, just, just remember, your mileage may vary out there on the internet. A lot of people will use them interchangeably, so double check what they're talking about before you kind of, oh, infrastructure as code using, you know, Chef. Like, wait, what? <laughs> and, Right. Well, and, and there are tools that can do both. You got to think, right? Things like Chef can configure your Windows VM, but it can also configure your Azure or your Hyper V or your VMware to have a VM, right? So in a way, it can do a little bit of both. And there are some out there that will do that. DSC, sure, I could say DSC to this Hyper V server, you must have four VMs. Uh, I generally wouldn't, but I could. <laughs> right? I, I use DSC for the inside configuration. I kind of actually like that term. Um, in a lot of cases, even the pipeline itself can configure, can, can exist as code. So if you look at things like GitLab, um, they actually create a YAML file, which is that defines your pipeline. So, so the, the build process that you've built, the variables you've defined, this can exist in a YAML file in your repository with the rest of your application right, or workload. Uh, VSDS has this as well. It's a little bit of a new feature, um, and there are certain parts of the interface and certain features that don't use it yet. Um, but that's, that's, that's certainly attainable. And, and like I said, a lot of those other tools will have the same kind of thing. So the cool thing is there, I'm, I I'll give you an example. I had a build that failed recently and um, we weren't sure why it was working yesterday. It stopped working. It was because GitHub enforced the TLS 1.2 a couple of weeks back. And so PowerShell by default uses what? TLS 1.1. So all of our get kind of commands that went and downloaded stuff from GitHub were erroring out. So we just went in, found, found the, the issue fixed it, and the build started working. Because that's all in code, we didn't, we didn't leave the editor. Just went and found out what the problem is, go fi you know, put that system secure, you know, .NET thing in there to, to make it TLS 1.2 and everything starts working again as it should. So when your pipeline's in code, that's nice. Everything kind of is tied together and everything is packageable. Okay, let's do a demo. Demos are good. All right. Fairly simple demo, so don't get too excited. <laughs> All right. So, PowerShell. That's where it all starts, right? I got a PowerShell script. Um, any confusion as to what it does? No? Okay. That's right. Yeah, I've got some hidden alias in there. <laughs> it does, in fact, kill puppies. <laughs> All right, so I have, uh, let's just go and create a new one, give you guys a, a feel for it. So this is Visual Studio Team Services. Um, this is actually the project home, and if you go and look at the code here, I'll just give you a quick walkthrough so you're not completely alien to what's going on. Um, all right, so this is my Git repo with all those files that we were just looking at. We've got our Hello World file here. Uh, now, because Visual Studio owns the source control bit as well, it's nicely integrated, um, but you can plug this in and point it to Git or anything like that. Uh, and again, it doesn't really matter because it'll be slightly different if you used a different uh, platform. The uh, reason I like VSTS is it's, it's kind of like GitLab in that it's, it's all-encompassing. All it handles the whole chain for me um, as opposed to just parts of the chain. It also gives me unlimited private repos, and being I do a lot of this for work and I can't put it all out in the public, it's nice to not have to pay GitHub seven bucks a month every <laughs> anymore. So we're going to go over to, here to builds, and we're just going to build a, an empty build from scratch, which shouldn't be too hard because it's a Hello World script, right? All right. So as you can see, we've got multiple sources here. We can, we can pick a bunch of other sources if we want, but we're just going to pick this one. And we're going to start an empty process. So when I first started getting into this, I always thought that 
production was the branch, and now I know basically you patch your artifact through that. And so what you're doing here is you're building an artifact. Right. Generally what happens, and this is one of the things that I kind of confused me at the start of this journey. Um, Build release pipeline, the wording and the verbiage that's used there is designed 20 years ago for devs. So when devs compile code, they generally build it. They have to build symbols, they have to you know, build DLLs, they have to do all this stuff. And then they create releases, EXEs, MSIs, whatever. Um, I had a hard time getting my head around it. I was like, well, wait, what part of my stack goes into build? And what part of my stack goes into release? And eventually it was kind of explained to me that I should stop worrying about it because the words in the tool are fairly irrelevant. These are just different automation points in a chain. And so depending on the example, um, you know, you did a great, uh, you did the info blocks. And so in order to do, your, do his testing, he had to throw up an entire environment so he can test against a real info blocks because, you know, it's really, just one, uh, I can't test infrastructure against a pretend infrastructure. It just doesn't work all the time. So if I, let's say I come up with a new, I patch a gold image, you know, encode somehow. And I'm like, okay, that gold image, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw up a VM in the build process. I'm not just creating an artifact, I'm gonna throw up a VM so that I can actually do the tests. The tests are gonna see if the VM is good, if everything works. If it does, maybe then I package that VHD, that's my artifact, right? Now I go dump it into Azure Storage or AWS AMI or whatever, and then it's ready for all my future servers to utilize, right? But there are other cases that I don't need to do. Why would I need to build a VM in the build process? I, I, I wanna build the VM in the release process. So, you know, again, take it as a, take it at face value and, and kind of do whatever works for you to your given task. And, and those tasks will be different. Um, so don't think you always have to do this in release and you always have to do this in, in, a, in you know, build. That's, that's not really how it works for us ops folks. So. Yeah, I was just gonna say, was, I guess the reason I brought that up was just for me, it was important to, uh, it was new learning I didn't know. And then once I understood it, it helped me uh, uh, find stuff to, online about it. Right. And, and I've got some really simple ones that literally all they do is grab the repository and then put some of those files in a drop folder as an artifact because I need them to pass through to the release phase. Um, but I don't need it all. I just need certain parts of it. And then I've got other environments that build entire Azure pieces of infrastructure so they can run tests and other such things. Um, so again, it really depends on what the type of project is and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but the flexibility is there to do whatever you want. I have some simple ones that are basically the release terms. Yep. Well, I... I if you're doing a if you're doing a PS module, for the most part, your build should have created the module. Um, your release should really just be the published module uh, with the you know the API key. And maybe you have multiple releases. Maybe you got a private feed, and then you've got the PowerShell gallery. And maybe you put everything up to the private feed, but only major releases up to the gallery or something like that. You can have different releases for those. So here we're going to find our script. Um, so you notice it's just letting us browse our repo because it's integrated. So it's like, what do you got for me? Um, hello world. All right, no arguments, keep it simple. And off it goes, running its thing. Uh, can anyone see that browser all right? Is that good? Yeah. Okay, this log might be a little small. I'll, I'll zoom in if, if we can. Uh, well, so, so these agent, this agent is just a Windows kind of installer package that installs on top of a, a VM or, or a physical box. Um, you know, if you have access to that box as a local build agent, you can do whatever you want. And the, I, I believe the way the Jenkins, the Jenkins agent runs on Java, but again, once you get, that, that's really just the communication path between the build server and the, the build master or the build platform. Um, I got a few slides on that in a minute because again, that really doesn't matter because you can run anything you want on that Jenkins build box. Um, the, you know, I, I don't know if there, I, I'm assuming there's probably a proprietary, proprietary protocol going on, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly HTTPS because I can deploy this to on-premises machines, um, install the agent, and they talk back to VSTS, which is a cloud application. So I'm deliberately not talking about TFS because nobody wants to. <laughs> hey, even Microsoft don't want you to. They want to talk about VSTS. It's all about recurring revenue, people. <laughs> all right. So let's go through what's happened here. So as you can see, it was really simple to set up that build. I pointed it at a script. 
and that was about it. <laughs> so what the build agent has done is like, okay, cool. I've got to go download your code so that I have all those files that you told me I can use. So it's gone and cloned the repo to the build agent. This is all kind of, um, if, uh, what's the word, ephemeral or whatever. It, it, it's all temporary. Once the build finishes, all of that gets flushed, goes away. So that build server is in the same state it was before, ready to go for the next project. So it's cloned our, our repo. It's running our PowerShell script. And as you can see there, we got our hello world. Very complicated stuff, right? Everyone can, can manage that, right? No, no challenges here. All right, you're all into the release pilot model. We're good, see ya. <laughs> so that by itself is not particularly useful as an example. So let's go and amend this and make it a little more complicated. And this is really just to highlight um, what the build, build platforms themselves are capable of. So actually, I'm not gonna, I've got this one built already, so I'm just gonna go and run that. Most build servers have access to the internet, right? Yes, but they don't, well, so if you're using a cloud-based build tool like VSTS, it would technically need to have access at some point because that's its communication channel, um, but you don't have to do that. If you were running Jenkins on-premise and it could access a build server that had PowerCLI on, Jenkins could trigger a bunch of VMware builds. Right? None of this is really tied to the Microsoft platform or anything that I'm demoing. Um, if you had you know, restricted environments that couldn't talk to the internet, you would just need to have an on-premise uh, build platform, right? Yeah, I am using VSTS, and I'm, I have to say that because, so really anything you could pull down from the internet, you could put on your build server and then use it for the rest of your build. Absolutely, yep, yep. So, <coughs> let me find the one, I'm just gonna go and trigger this build here. Right. Does this rely on extra code as well? Uh, well right. So uh, you notice we were using like a task that was already created in VSTS, so we had a PowerShell task. Um, generally, the build agent's pretty intelligent. If it starts getting errors thrown back at it and it has to skip the next part of the build, it's going to show up as a fail. Um, and I can show you a failed one here just to give you a quick walkthrough. Um, so this had a hard... I think I canceled this because it was taking too long. Um, but this was trying to... Oh no, it gave me an error. So this is trying to run an ARM template, right? And it errored out on something, I couldn't even tell you what it was, um, but it errored out. And, and that basically triggers a fail, right? If you start getting PowerShell error messages in your PowerShell scripts, the build's gonna fail. If you were running something a little more proprietary, a little more native code, you would obviously need to find a way to trigger to the system, hey, this did not work. Um, so again, it would probably be looking for things like exit codes and stuff like that. Most of the tasks that are built into the platform are they're fairly easy and, and working out of the box. Oh, it's finished already, sorry. <laughs> it had so much to do. All right, so I've actually got two, world, two, two jobs running here, so you'll recognize this one because it'll look the same as the one we did before. Uh, and this is just to kind of demonstrate that you can trigger certain parts of the build process to happen in order. And as you build these different phases, as they call them here, you can say, I want this phase to run regardless of the phase before. I want this to only run if the phase before succeeded, um, you know, because certain things depend on things before them happening and other things don't. Um, so you can break this up into different phases and do stuff here. So here we've got our PowerShell script. Now this was the hello world one, and this one says hello world. Now the second one says hello summit 18 from Ryan. And let me show you how it got that. So if you look at version two of the script here, version two of the script has parameters, okay? So it can do clever stuff, like take in a name uh, or two and give me some appropriate output. So I, and let's go back to our browser. If we go back and look at this build definition. Man, this Hello World demo is taking way too long. <laughs> I'm going to do what everyone else did next year. I'm just going to video it and let you watch <laughs> without me talking. So this is our first one, right? It just calls in the script. But you notice we got this argument box down here. So in our second one, we call in the, the, the separate script, the one with parameters, and we're actually just feeding in those parameters, just like if you're on the, the command line, right? Um, now this one's of particular interest, and I want to kind of highlight this. You can obviously feed these parameters in, which is cool if you want to hard code it and need it to be hard coded, but this 
this variable here, this is actually a variable stored by the build system. So I, you know, if, if I was not the person to run this build and someone else was, it would have their name. Um, or if this was triggered by a CI automatically, it would probably say the CI build's name. Um, so that's one of the values of a, of a build platform like this. It can store and obfuscate variables and keep them kind of hidden and stuff like that so that you don't have to you know, manually feed those in. And you also don't want to keep those kind of secrets and details in your source code either. So you want to have a platform that can kind of obfuscate that. And, and I've got a more a bigger demo on that a bit later. Uh, that's a good question. So normally if I was doing, say, a, a PowerShell module here, I, I, instead of running, you know, instead of running Hello World, I'd probably be running a Saki script, and the Saki would probably have a test element to it. That test element's going to generate an XML file. So um, depending on how you wrote the Saki script, right, that, could con that could be considered a failure e anyway, even if it failed the test. But what's normally going to happen is you're going to want to see that XML file imported into Visual Studio, into VSTS or your build platform. Uh, VSTS lets you just plug that in. It has a publish test results option, and you would just set it to end unit, point it at the pester XML output, and uh, it would actually display what failed, what didn't, what the percentage of pass was. If you had code coverage kind of stuff, it would show that. Um, wherever that happens at release or build is up to you. Um, most people would probably be doing script analyzer stuff at build. Um, I assume most of, you, most of you kind of playing around with modules and stuff already, right? Yeah, so if you're building a module, you're packaging it up, you're running through the process, you're gonna to wanna to run those tests at your build process because your build's gonna fail if your tests fail. You don't wanna create a module and put it somewhere if your test failed. So um, that would be as simple as I go here, um, and I would just go and find the test results. And I can publish test results there. I think there's actually a pester module built in as well, maybe. Yeah, I can run some pester stuff here, um, but most people will have that already tied in in Saki anyway. Uh, that way it's all in code as opposed to in two different places, because um, if you put it in your in your Saki script, you can make amends to that before you before you update the repository. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, no, this is just a caveat. I think I mentioned already. Um, again, don't worry about VSTS. This is not the only tool on the block. Um, I know a lot of you here are using different tools. Um, hopefully the concepts will start making sense. And again, use whatever tool chain makes sense for you. Let's skip over that. All right, so the build process. Um, you know, once we got our code, everything's happy, we got to do builds. Now, here's how I'm going to click through this. So everything starts to code. We've talked about that. Then we have a build platform. And the build platform generally needs an agent. One build server, 10 build servers, whatever. Um, now, VSTS has the concept of a hosted build agent because it's a SaaS platform. Um, this is how things like AppVayor and Team City work. For the most part, you're just using their grunt power to do all the work. Um, when you move into the enterprise space and you look at platforms like Jenkins, those build servers are local. Um, you generally control those. They're not usually hosted. Um, and then we have this concept of capabilities. Now, these potentially are called different things in different worlds. They're called capabilities in VSTS, and that's what I know. So what a capability is, is let's say I have a build agent that has Node and Python on, and then I have a build agent that doesn't have Node and Python on. If I have a, if I have a build for a Python app, I'm going to have to tell that build, hey, you need Python 3. And when it goes and picks which agent to dump it on, it's going to have to find one that matches that capability. So you can configure your, your agents and say, this one is... This one has all the things, and this one just is PowerShell. <laughs> so don't send all the things to this one. Um, you know, this is particularly good in large enterprises or huge code bases where you're doing a lot of different builds. You know, you might not if if, if you had to use the same build servers all the devs, you're probably sitting there going, you are queued at position 100, and your module is never going to compile, right? <laughs> you, you don't want to be that guy. You just put, can I have my own build server? You just put PowerShell on it. I'll take it from there. Um, and again, that's what capabilities are. You can match your builds to the capabilities of the agents so that the platform can decide where to put your, put your work. All right, so builds occurs on agents. Um, build agents are just a server. In fact, I think I said that on the last slide. Yeah, servers. All right, that's all a build agent is. It's a server. In fact, it can be a desktop. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a server. It's just a platform with an agent installed that talks, talks to the, the build platform. What you do with that box is up to you. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you want to put PowerShell core on it, 
put PowerShell Core. You want to put PowerShell 5.1 on it? It's probably already got it. Um, you want to install VSTS and get all access to the MS build tools and those kind of things? Great. Put Py that is your build. That is your, your agent. You do what you want with it. Um, if you want to keep it lean and slim and make it a, like an Ubuntu box somewhere, it's only going to be able to do things that that lean, slim Ubuntu box can do, right? So don't expect any Windows desktop things to, <laughs> to be callable from that agent, right? Um, capabilities can vary between agent. We talked about that. So you can basically your build platform can decide where to put things. Um, again, most people kind of have one build agent, <laughs> okay? Especially in our world, the ops world, we don't generally have builds that take hours and hours and hours at a time. Um, but as we move into bigger and larger kind of infrastructure sets and we need to fire them up for tests, I mean, I think, uh, you know, in your, your example, you're taking like maybe eight or nine minutes for that one part of the process. Um, so I'm, some of you weren't here earlier. I was talk, joking about this. Uh, VSTS is a free, free account I'm using. It has 40 minutes of build time per user. And I've been troubleshooting my builds this week before today. And I got the error last night that I'd run out of build minutes. <laughs> I was like, that's embarrassing, so I have to show this off tomorrow. <laughs> Fortunately, I have a private agent as well, but when you're doing operational builds, when you're doing infrastructure builds, it's not like I'm just taking a bunch of stuff, zipping it up, moving some files around, and creating a PowerShell module. That's fairly quick. If I've got to wait for an Azure virtual machine to build, or for three of them, all that waiting time is considered runtime, and you're tying up the build agent until it finishes. So in larger orgs, you start hogging the build agent for 20 minutes when they've only got one of them, your devs are gonna get a little upset at you. So think about throwing up your own one on your, you know, you can run this on VMware, bare metal. Well, build agent can only really do one thing at a time, or no, or no, or no. Well, it depends on the software stack you're using. Uh, for the most part, because of the way they clean themselves up afterwards, you probably don't want them doing too many things at once. Um, but I mean, I'll be honest, I've, I've never never thought about it. I mean, it seems like a waste, doesn't it? <laughs> PowerShell, like, they could just do multiple run states. Right, but your file system and your, and so that'll be good for your variables and stuff like that. Um, and I think from what I understand is if you do agent phases and they run, you can have them run simultaneously and they would be on the same build box, um, but you can trip yourself up because, yeah, you know, right, exactly. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. Uh, again, having probably a bunch of smaller VMs might be a better option. But again, depending on your tool, depends on what that costs. If you look at AppVeya, I think hosted, app, hosted instances on AppVeya, or sorry, self-hosted instances, count as enterprise. You have to buy AppVeya enterprise to do that. Um, I could be wrong, they may have changed. But bear that in mind, your platform of choice may dictate what your options are there. I think Jenkins is the most common one out there, and it's, it's an on-premise platform, it's open source, you do what you want with it. So, you know, that, that's, that's also the one with the, the most info out there. I mean, it's, 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 it's not new. Jenkins has been around, you know, for a long time. It's very, it's very stable, very vetted. Um, you know, they get some new stuff coming out with their pipeline, which is pretty interesting, but. Yep. <laughs> so. The, the build agent interacts with the environment, and that's the important part. Um, for infrastructure guys like us, if we're running hosted, you know, app or something like that, it's a hosted thing. It's cool if I'm just packaging up some stuff I gave it in my Git repo, but what if I wanted my build server to do something to infrastructure on premises? Well, okay, maybe I, if it's hosted, I could open up a firewall rule and let you into my environment. Nope, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. If your build agent is local and it has access to infrastructure systems locally, and it has the appropriate modules and access, it can do stuff to them. So if you had a local hosted build agent and it had PowerCLI on it, it can go and build VMs for you. It can create virtual switches. It can delete VMs. I'd avoid that. You might get in trouble, right? If it can access the SAN, you know, if you can make REST calls to your EMC or your info blocks, right? If it's local and can have access to that, it can do all those things. So from an operations standpoint, having on-premises build agents really does kind of open up some options to us. I'm a cloud guy, that's the infrastructure I get to play with these days, so it doesn't matter as much to me because I can hit Azure from anywhere. <laughs> but you know, for those of you who've got huge on-premises footprints and your tools are designed to work with those you know, footprints, having local build agents is where you're gonna be, wanna be at and they can interact with whatever you let them interact with. So I wouldn't suggest just putting them on the server VLAN and calling it a day, but you know, uh, as long as you give them the access they need, they can, they can do things. Uh, build is often considered a run once step. We talked about this. Um, it's generally considered the piece that creates artifacts that can be used in multiple releases down the road, but that's a traditional way of looking at it. That is, is not, not, not a requirement. You don't need to worry about it. If you've got some interesting kind of way of doing things, you want to do it, 
do what works for you guys. If your build breaks, fix it. Um, I put this in just at the end last night. Um, in order for build pipeline to be used heavily and to, to be your source of kind of truth and your source of change, um, you have to trust it. And I, you know, you'll see this more in the test slide, but if you don't trust it, you're not gonna use it. If your build breaks and you go, eh, I gotta fix it by hand because I gotta get it working, that's cool, but what's the chances you trust your build pipeline next time? Well, by the way, it's still broken because you didn't fix it. Um, if your build breaks, fix it. A lot of these platforms will automatically raise issues in GitHub if, they, if the build breaks. You know, VSTS will create a work item as a bug and you know, put it on the backlog so that your, your product manager or whatever can go, hey, you know, something's broken, the build's broken, fix it. It's a high priority. Um, especially when you're dealing with other people. If you have a large ops team and you've got multiple people using these platforms, if your build breaks, you're now not just affecting something that you fixed by hand, you're affecting these other, other folks as well. So again, in order to build trust in the system, we have to make sure the system works and we have to be willing to jump in and fix it when it stops working. Hmm. I don't know if I'm gonna do this demo right. Let's, uh, let's see if it works. Question. You might have mentioned this. Can you export the build from BSTS? Um, so at the moment, yeah, so, so you can get to it. I believe it's in some mangled JSON format traditionally. VSDS, as of like late last year, introduced uh, YAML build definitions, but there is not feature parity between the YAML build definition and you know the, the traditional JSON one that you do for the GUI. Um, you can get hold of that JSON one and, and use it for things. I mean, manual changes to it and import it into another VTS, VSTS platform, you can do that. Um, in fact, uh, Stephen Murawski uh, gave me one of his for his Hugo website because I was working on the same thing at the time. And uh, you know, I, I just pick and, pick and mix to what bits worked for me and what bits didn't. I would definitely suggest if you can use the YAML stuff, moving towards that because having your pipeline in your code is a much better place for it. Um, you know, it's, I'd say it's definitely more English readable than the JSON file that you traditionally got. Um, but again, there are limitations at the moment. There's certain things that it can't do. Um, and at the same time, there's certain things it can do that the other one can't do. So your mileage may vary, but they've got that fairly well documented. Um, and again, things like GitLab have a YAML based, uh, you know, pipeline as code as well. And I think most other folks have something similar. I think AppVea have a YAML interface as well that you can do things, yeah. Um, I'm running out of time, so I don't know if I need to do a PowerShell module. Uh, tomorrow, Adam Murray has an entire session on building a PowerShell module with VSTS and having your own private repo, private feed and stuff like that. It's cool. It, I was going to run through it, but I'm a little short on time. So, <laughs> All right, test. Oddly, I have no builds to show you with tests because I'm not the world's best pester person. <laughs> and ironically, I'm going to tell you this is the most important step. <laughs> right? So... You know, I don't claim to know everything, <laughs> but here's the thing, right? Test is your most critical step, and it comes back to what we talked about fixing your builds when they break. If you're going to trust this um, platform and process to increase your cadence of delivery, if you want to deliver changes quicker into your organization, everybody from in the organization needs to trust the process. Um, you know, part of this talk came about because last year the NHS in the UK had a problem where you know, they got hit by ransomware or something, and it turned out that they hadn't patched for like six months. It's hard, patching's hard. And, and patching, patching is hard when you're doing it on 60,000 endpoints by hand, right, or by wusses, uh, but patching doesn't have to be hard. And, and that's where this talk kind of spawned from was, well, why does it have to be hard? Why don't you have a pipeline every time you get a new KB come out, you use DISM to apply it to an image, you fire the image up, run a bunch of pester tests, run a bunch of Selenium tests, just be comfortable enough to say, it's 90% there, QA team, go do your 10% of work, right? It doesn't have to be hard. And that's what automation gives us. And, and we're kind of already on that edge to begin with, so I don't need to preach to the choir. But I think that's important to take away, you know? A lot of the security kind of is issues we have are really around our ability to keep up, you know? You know, when, when, when ransomware hits, when zero days hit, and you know, a lot of them aren't zero days for, for some people, some people know, <laughs> right? But our ability to adapt and, and you know, respond to them needs to be shortened. And, you know, we can't wait six months to patch a box when, you know, the, the problems like this occur, you know? And I'm sure you've all kind of been through the sessions and security talks and all that kind of stuff. We, we, all, we all know the fear mongering. The test is important. It's also probably the most useful to us as ops people. And we're not really testing if the logic in the PowerShell module works, we can do things like inspect and pester infrastructure tests to say, hey, I got this, got this definition for a new environment. 
it's supposed to do this. I'm supposed to be able to hit it on port 443. It's supposed to have a certificate that doesn't throw an error. Is all that true? Yes, 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 yes. No, fail. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, cool. Okay, I'm ready to roll that out. It works. Uh, so pester infrastructure testing is kind of a, you know, interesting play. It's also a very long, long-winded kind of testing compared to like when you're doing a, a unit test on a piece of code, seconds. When you're doing ping tests to remote servers and connection tests, slower, 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 slower. And again, this comes down to having a pool of build servers because that test could tie, yourselves, tie you up for an hour. But what would it take you to do those tests manually? Probably more than an hour. Probably, you know, you wouldn't do them because it takes too long. <laughs> and then you find yourself in the same boat. So the testing step is critical. Um, there's lots of tools out there we can use for testing. Basically anything that will either pass the build or fail the build could be considered a test. You don't have to get the pretty little results out in an XML file, right? You could write your own PowerShell wrappers that throw errors and stuff like that if you wanted. The idea is really that what I've done, is it what I want it to have done? Yes, no. Okay, I can continue with that. And again, we got proper support for Pester, Poshbeck, Inspect, anything that generally does those kind of testing things will have a lot of native support in most of these platforms. Um, you know, again, uh, consider private agents. They're going to have access to the rest of your infrastructure, which oftentimes you're going to need. Does this machine join the domain? Does it not join the domain? Does it have some weird error? If it joins the domain, cool. But when you delete it, make sure you go and remove the computer account that you just created, right? So I guess the point is that my build could run something wrong with the code, so what it actually produced wasn't exactly the result I was looking for. And so in addition to just saying success, I need something that actually reaches out and looks to see if all, everything turned out the way I thought it was going to. Right. I mean, from an infrastructure perspective, go back to the example, let's say I'm throwing up a web farm. And so I know that a web farm has to have more than one web server. They have to have identical configurations. They have to be load balanced. They have to have certificates on them. That's cool. But if I had some, if I deployed the wrong ARM template and it deployed a SQL cluster, the build would pass. Cool, you're good, thanks, everything worked. But you'd sit there and go, why can't I connect to IIS? But somehow I can connect to SQL, that's weird, right? You, your infrastructure tests are there for you to verify that what you've done is what you wanted to have done, right? And, and again, when we're doing a unit test, that's fairly simple. It's like, does one on one equal two? No, what did I do wrong there, right? We've got to do something a little more involved. We've got to spend 10 minutes building up an infrastructure just to test we spun up the right infrastructure. But if you're, once you're happy with that, that's it. You save your artifacts, you're good. You know that this is good to deploy web server farms going forward, and, right? So, I mean, that's, again, testing is one of those things that everybody does a little stronger or lighter than others. But, you know, and something I think in the infrastructure world, we don't really take too seriously. We have monitoring tools, and we, we love monitoring tools. Monitoring tools, however, are on what we call the trailing edge. They tell you about a problem after it's happened, right? Whereas when we do testing, we're talking about leading edge. We want to test those things before we put them into production, before, you know, at least validate that 99% sure that we're not gonna introduce a problem. And we need that in order to move at the cadence we expect to move at. If we've gotta deploy things at this kind of, you know, massive scale that we're dealing with today, with these ever-changing pieces of software. Oh, yeah, I do Azure, right? So literally, I deal with changes every month, probably every three weeks, right? And those can be in the middle of conversations with customers. Oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is working. Oh wait, they changed that, hold on. I gotta go change it. You know, it's not the world we're used to. We're used to that kind of two year release cadence. I don't have to relearn a thing till Windows 2019 comes out. Yay me, right? That's just not how it works anymore, right? So releases, releases come in many flavors. They don't have to be production. Um, I do wanna try to get through this demo and I've got one minute. So I'm gonna skip this line really quickly. I'm gonna go, go back to a demo. So, um, let us go back to, actually, you know what? I don't need to show you the build. I'm just gonna show you the releases. So, we are going to, see, look at all this stuff. This is what I did while y'all were drinking all week. <laughs> I, I avoided drinking until I got all the green ticks. <laughs> no, well, that's what I said, at, 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 at 346, I'm no longer stressed this week. <laughs> I can go and drink. So we're just gonna create, create a release. Um, now you notice that this release has multiple environments. All right, so let's drill into release 31 here. So I'm like really zoomed in now from our last demo, so. And 
for whatever reason, Firefox does not want to update properly. Now, this was actually put together part of another demo. There was a guy in here earlier in the session before. I don't know if he stuck around, but he was asking about um, uh, when you use an Azure automation, can you get the DSC scripts from source control? which at the moment you can't. Um, this pre-deploy is actually taking a bunch of DSC scripts and injecting them into Azure Automation DSC, and if they've changed, it'll recompile them. Um, that was gonna be part of the demo, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> and it's fairly unrelated to my talk. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to try and demo stuff that was useful, but then I realized a lot of stuff that we do takes more than 40 minutes, so. <laughs> I've, I've done some high-level stuff to kind of get the point across. So let's go have a look at these environments here. Um, let's go look at our logs. So we're deploying into four, here, let me actually show you this first. We're deploying into four simultaneous environments. Um, well, no we're not, we're, we're triggering them, there you go. These only deploy if the one before it passes. Um, they don't have to be like that. That's how you would traditionally do test prod, you know, dev test prod, whatever. Um, but let's say you were doing, you, you would potentially have ones like this. Right. If you were doing, um, say, I want to deploy to the MS gallery in my module, but I also want to deploy to my internal gallery for internal users, they don't have to be one after the other. They can be at the same time, but they're going to have different API keys, they can have different push commands potentially, so you would have two releases for those. But they don't depend on one another, so they can run simultaneously. Right. So let me go back and look at our logs now. And this is just another demo of how we can obfuscate stuff through our, you know, different, environable, different environments generally require different parameters, different configurations, different names, all kinds of stuff. So if we go look at our logs here, these guys are all running a fairly simple script and I have that script here. All right, this is the script it's running. Okay, it's asking for a release environment and it's asking for an admin username and then it's returning those on the, on, the, on the prompt. That's literally all it's doing. I love these demos, they're really easy. <laughs> okay, unlike this timer, which is over. All right, um, so here we go through our pre-deploy. We don't need to do that because that's not running. This is our dev environment. Let's look at our dev environment. Here you go, environment says dev and the admin name is dev admin. That all makes sense? Can you see it all? Okay, so then we got our test environment and it's running the exact same script, but it's, it's being fed in different parameters because it's got different values. So this is the test environment and the admin account name is test admin. So this is really good when you're building infrastructure like well these local admin accounts do not need to have the production local admin account stuff on them ever because I don't really need that to be getting given out to the help desk guys and all the other people playing with the, the dev environment. <laughs> now our prod one's really interesting and this is just again to show you another demo. Um, this one uh, says prod, but it doesn't display our admin username. And the reason for that is in the variables for the releases up here, I'll show you where they're all defined. If we go and edit this and go to our variables here, you'll see I've got these various variables and they're, they're scoped to certain environments, right? And this one is marked as secure, which means it'll never, it'll always be starred out in the logs. Right, which is really important because you don't ever want that stuff showing up. Hi, Jeffrey. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right. Oh, there you go. We just did that. So what's next? Um, definitely start to look at ways to codify your infrastructure. Um, you know, DSC sounds like you guys have all started. Um, you know, uh, Chef, Puppet, whatever you're using, start playing around with it, start trying to deploy it. A lot of these build tools have free tiers, you know, Jenkins open source completely, VSTS free for five users, um, you know, AppVeyor has a free tier, Team City I think has something similar. Start playing around with them, start getting a feel for them, seeing what you can do. Most of these cloud-based ones automatically have tie-ins to like AWS and, and Azure and stuff like that where you can throw up test environments, you know, for, for validation. Um, there's a session tomorrow of Adam Murray. He's going to go for VT, VSTS CI CD for a PowerShell module with private feeds. So if you're interested in that, it's pretty good. Corey Wood, I think, has a Jenkins session coming up. Maybe. Could be wrong. And uh, Gabriel Rojas, uh, you'll need a DeLorean because this one was a couple hours ago. <laughs> he, had a, he had another interesting CI CD one. I, I think his one was the maybe the Kubernetes Jenkins containers one earlier today, um, but it could be wrong. There's, there's a couple of them this week. Uh, there's also some great um, Pluralsight courses. Have anyone got a Pluralsight subscription here? Uh, there's a guy called um, 
David O'Brien, I think, he's an Aussie, and he has a really good uh, VSTS kind of Pluralsight course, really great, helped me out a lot. Um, anyone familiar with the Microsoft Academy? Not the Virtual Academy, it's Microsoft Academy. They have a program called DevOps, it's about eight different edX courses. It's a lot dev heavy, but it's going to go through containers, it's going to go through these secret management variables and all this kind of stuff. It's free. You don't have to get the cert, so you don't have to pay for it. Really good stuff. So um, I'll put these slide decks up online, um, and I'll probably start putting some of that sample code and maybe a, a few videos if I can get them to work so that you can see real, real demos that work. Um, but feel free to take a picture of this one if it's of value to you. Um, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Um, hope I didn't ramble too much. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. All right, no more stress. <laughs> it's beer time. <laughs>